up, everybody? Hope everybody's well. Welcome back uh, to the Onyx Report. You know, hope everybody's day is going all right. We in here doing our thing. Y'all know me. Um, hello, hello. All right. So um, we are in here. We are knocking it out. Things are going well. Uh, so welcome to the Onyx Report, where uh, black male justice advocates uplift black men and boys using critical analysis. And we will definitely be doing that today. Um, have some uh, some good information that you guys are going to really get something out of today. Uh, but y'all know me. Uh, I like to start out by first uh, really acknowledging, um, you know, some of the people that make the show possible. Um, I'm going to not only do I acknowledge the the subscribers, which I'm going to do in a second, but I also want to shout out my mods. I want to thank you all for the, for what you guys have been doing over this last year and what you continue to do. Um, but real quick, uh, looking at uh, who's in here so far. Uh, let me see. Get my thing scrolled up properly. What's up, Michael Grinch? What's happening, man? Malika. Uh, we got uh, Barry Little. What's going on? Mr. Heat, Rashid, right? Hope everybody is well. Judge, what's going on, man? Good to see you in here, All right? So we are just getting going on this uh, Wednesday, March 10th. Let's see. All right. So Diggy, Will, All right? Jim and I, what's going on? All right. New style. What's happening, man? All right. Oh, we're getting people in. Uh, let me see. So just want to remind you guys, um, that, you know, we, uh, we need to acknowledge, well, I'll do that in a second. So I'll start out by just acknowledging, uh, my supporters. So let's get that in. So we got a few more people coming through. Uh, Tay Moore coming over from BGS. Welcome. Miss Kalila, good to see you as usual. Mike, what's happening? Alan, uh, proud to be a simp. What's up? Man? <laughs> that name is killing me. Um, anyway, hope everybody's well. We get... All right. Appreciate that, Malika. Appreciate the support. Uh, and uh, I was just about to actually say that. Make sure you guys do uh, support the Onyx Report. Right. We have a variety of levels of membership that start out at gold and go all the way to black opal. So you can really just, as it says there, click the join button right next to the subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, so please go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell so you can get notified as to when I go live. And I'm broadcasting daily now. So you'll get content uh, usually in the early morning as far as the daily black masculinist news feed. And then, of course, Wednesdays, I go live uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, so support the show, but also become a member and you can do so on YouTube and choose what level or you can go to Patreon.com and you can support the film review series uh, that I do every month uh, where I review uh, a number of films or you can be, uh, support the Institute for Black Male Studies uh, via uh, Patreon. So you can do that as well. Uh, so either way is definitely appreciated. So make sure you figure out a way to support so we can keep this stream going. Shout out to Gold Professor. Appreciate that support. Um, Michael Brown, what's going on? All right. So uh, let's see here. All right. Rashid, appreciate that cash app. All right. All right. So let me get past this. Let me get this going here. All right. So y'all know 
over here we support black men, right? So uh, basically, what I like to do is a series every week uh, that I've entitled the hashtag uh, Sacred Black Masculine Series. And basically what that is is an acknowledgement of black men who on one level or another are doing their thing. And this is not to suggest that black men aren't or haven't been, but it is actually to suggest that it's a regular thing, but it's a regular thing that tends to go unacknowledged. As a matter of fact, before I do that, let me just quickly say, because I just got notified about this literally like 60 seconds before the show. Um, so I got, you know, I've been telling brothers to not only get support, not only get therapy in regard to depression, in regard to, you know, bouts with suicide, particularly during this pandemic. You know, that's been something that uh, black men have been grappling with. But I've also urged you guys to, especially if you're over, you know, come approaching 40 or above, to get actually get checked out for cancer, uh, particularly colon cancer. Right. To also get checked out for your prostate, all these kind of things. So I just got my my my, you know. Uh, report back as far as cancer is concerned and it was clean but uh it's definitely something i want to urge you to do if it's at all something you can make sure you knock it out uh because we tend to be highly susceptible uh, especially to particular types of cancer as i said prostate and colon most particularly so please make sure my brothers y'all get y'all go ahead and get that checked out anyway all right so looking first at our sacred black masculine series person of the week Y'all know him, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the man, right? Uh, this is an article you can actually find on uh, NBCLosAngeles.com, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar auctioned four championship rings for nearly $3 million and gave it uh, to a kid's charity. Uh, Mr. Abdul-Jabbar sold his four championship rings, three MVP trophies, and other memorabilia, memorabilia excuse me, for $2.8 million and will donate the money to youth education. Harlem in the building, um, Jabbar put 234 memorabilia items up for auction with the entirety of the proceeds going toward his chari charity, the Skyhook Foundation, whose mission is to give children in poor communities access to better educational opportunities. When it comes to choosing between storing a championship ring or a trophy in a room, he says, or providing kids with an opportunity to change their lives, the choice is pretty simple, sell it all, right? Uh, looking back on what I've done with my life, instead of gazing at the sparkle of jewels or gold playing, celebrating uh, something I did a long time ago, I'd rather look into the delighted face of a child holding their first caterpillar and thinking about what I might be doing for their future. That's a history that has no price. Right? He also said, let me see, they also go on each of Jabbar's four championship rings sold for over 245000 with his 1987 championship ring selling for a whopping $398,937.50, the highest of all the items. In addition to his rings, Jabbar also sold signed items like the basketball from his final regular season game and three of his most uh, valuable player trophies. So shout out to him for that. Much appreciation, uh, especially when you're doing these kind of things for the babies. Uh, that's what we need to continue to do. All right. So appreciation to him. Next up, this young man here, King Randall, who is 21 years old, right? Uh, this is an article you can find on www.walb.com entitled 21 year old to open new school in Albany will teach boys about life, right? The X for boys founder, King Randall, uh, will transform the former Isabella school into the New Life Preparatory School for Boys. Randall told WALB News, Tens Gabriel Ware, that he hopes, um, or Gabrielle Ware, excuse me, that he hopes the school will give Al Albany boys more opportunities for success. At the school, they'll teach uh, traditional academics as well as trade skills like welding and auto repair. Some other options will include the science of family and manhood, and there will also be firearms training. I ain't mad at that. Um, Randall uh, said he's been wanting to open a school since uh, he began the X for Boys program two years ago when he was only 19 years old. Doing different workshops, teaching young men how to do different skill trades. We're also doing a book club and teaching them how to read because 93% of the children I come into contact with can't read, right? Uh, but now we have an 86% reading comprehension rate, explained Randall. Randall said troubled young men in Albany want to better their lives. They just need more opportunity. So giving them a space where they're 
around a lot of other young men and around other men trying to mold you and train you. I've had kids uh, come uh, find me at my house, come knock and ask to join the X for Boys. I've had kids message me on Instagram, gang members, you name it. Uh, Randall said he worked with the Dougherty County School System to find the perfect location. He said, I gave the superintendent a call and asked if he had any school buildings they didn't mind getting rid of. And he was like, well, we have three buildings on the chopping block ready to be demolished. And I was like, oh, really? Uh, so when, so I went to go tour one of them and it is in great condition. Of course, it needs a little TLC, but they just stopped using it maybe about two years ago. Uh, explains Randall. He says um, he's received nationwide support for his new effort, uh, including receiving 10,000 masks from the Ford Motor Company for his future students. Word. 21 year old young man doing his thing. So, you know, shout out to him, King Randall. Uh, appreciate what you're doing. And it's definitely an example that uh, many of us need to follow in one way, shape, or form. Right? 21 years old. Knocking that out. Beautiful. Next up, young entrepreneur gifts $100,000 scholarships to 10 HBCU students. Right? This is a piece you can find in the Black Wall. The Black Walls Times. Well, that doesn't make sense. Okay, the Black Walls T Times. Weird. Okay, I think they're using Street as ST. So the Black Wall Street Times. So Street being ST. It's a little awkward. Anyway, dot com. Um, and the article is about one Bryce Thompson, 24 year old successful black entrepreneur. In addition, he's a Morehouse College graduate residing in the Atlanta area who pays his blessings forward. For Black History Month, he gifted 10 HBCU students with $100,000 scholarships in partnership with Scully. Uh, he remembers a time when he struggled as a college student. His uncle pitched in by covering his first year of tuition. Hence, he paid his uncle's blessing forward through the IM IAMS Foundation, which he founded. Uh, I know the feeling of not knowing if you can afford to go back to school, he said in an interview with Forbes magazine. He states, uh, I realize there are people who don't have a friend or family member that can step in help them the way my uncle did for me. He also added, I told myself that I would one day offer scholarships of my own to help students like myself avoid similar situation. He says, uh, he visited each HBCU student to hand them their reward personally. He traveled to Morehouse College, Texas Southern, Bethune Cook, Livingstone, Philander Smith, Prairie View A&M, Hampton, and Howard. Uh, his entrepreneurship journey began at Morehouse. He founded Trade House Investment group with some of his fraternity brothers and classmates. Trade House Investment Group is a company that partners with an educational platform and teaches people about how to properly invest in the foreign exchange market. In addition, his company's financial literacy, literacy component teaches disadvantaged communities how small investments can make a difference. And as a result of his uncle's blessing and his own entrepreneurial spirit, he can pay it forward. Right, 24-year-old young man, doing that. Now, I, I appreciate what he's doing. I applaud him for doing so. Uh, I do hope he realizes that black males are actually a minority at HBCUs at this point. And so I do think, I do hope that he will uh, target that uh, in some kind of way. And because for the most part, you know, black folks in general tend to lack inherited wealth. Uh, this has a huge impact on our ability to attend uh, college, right? Um, but at the end of the day, um, this kind of help can go a great uh, distance as it pertains to black males. So much appreciation uh, and acknowledgement for him doing that. Right. Powerful. All right. OK. All right. So our one pub public service announcement for the week, just one. Um, and this has to do with a very recent thing that many of you may already be familiar with. Um, there's a couple of places you can check it out. There's HuffPost.com. They have an article called House Passes George Floyd Bill Designed to Help Prevent Police Misconduct. And you can also go, actually go look at H.R. 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Uh, and you can see that at uh, Congress.gov. You can check it out there. I'm not going to go through it to any great extent uh, at this point, but I want you to check it out for yourself. Uh, essentially, what appreciate that, Papa uh, Ditus. Uh, much appreciation. Um, let's see. So basically, let me see. I'll look at a little bit of it here. 
so this is the Justice and Policing Act of 2020. The bill addresses a wide range of policies and issues regarding policing practices and law enforcement accountability. It includes measures to increase accountability for law enforcement uh, misconduct, to enhance transparency, transparency and data collection, and to eliminate discriminatory policing practices. Three main areas the bill focuses on is uh, lowers the criminal intent standard from willful to knowing or reckless to convict a law enforcement officer for misconduct in federal prosecution, limits qualified immunity as a defense to liability in a private civil action against a law enforcement officer uh, or state correctional officer, and authorizes the Justice of the Department of Justice to ensure subpoenas and investigations of police departments for uh, a pattern or practice of discrimination. There's a number of other things. That goes on in here. But as you can see, it's named after George Floyd. And as much as I appreciate that there is some kind of movement happening uh, after so many black men have found themselves at the wrong end, the unjust end of uh, a situation that often costs their lives. One of the things I would actually like to see is policy that actually targets and identifies black males explicitly. Um, that's one of the things I seldom see actually happening. And I get that they try to make these policies expansive so they impact everybody in one shape, one way, shape, or form, but this is actually becoming a problem to me. If you go check out the Black Male Political Agenda, right, you go look at that on uh, the blog, newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. It is the pinned article that you will see as soon as you open it up. And you look through there, one of the things you notice is that the policies are targeted directly toward Black men. And we are unapologetic in that. And we want that language to be in there because as soon as you make these policies that are supposed to uh, lift all boats, you know, with a rising tide, you tend to find that those that have been most subject to these kind of dynamics continue to be most subject to it. So I want policy on one level or another that directly acknowledges who the hell it's written for. And not just in the title where you mention somebody by name, but then abstract the rest of it. We want policy that is actually targeted and acknowledges publicly why it's targeting black men, because black men have been targeted so negatively uh, in regard to what you're actually trying to develop the policy for. Right. What the policy is supposed to fight against. It's not just about how police officers treat people. We need to talk about how black men are treated, not only in terms of law enforcement, but but also in terms of what happens in courts, what happens in terms of judgments and, of course, how often police officers get off with it, but get off with what? Get off with the abuse and murder of black males. So that's my public service announcement for the week. Can we actually acknowledge very publicly and in a forthright manner, the need black males in particular have, you know, all of this rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing needs to end. We need to be very specific about who we're talking about and why, because that always kind of gets sw swept under the rug when we actually start talking about, either philanthropy, resources, or policy. Then all of a sudden, it's everybody's gamble, right? Y'all saw my video the other day on BLM. You know, you, you're talking about millions and billions of dollars in some instances over the last five years. And the black males, you know, it, there's no, no critical advancement being made to directly solve the very issue that, that determined the reason for these organizations to come into existence. Black males get swept under the rug once policy and dollars hit the table, and that needs to stop. All right. All right. So that being said, move this along and just uh, remind you about um, the Institute for Black Male Studies. Support the Institute. You can do so through Patreon, or you can actually uh, go ahead and purchase items that you can find on the Institute website. If you click on merchandise in the menu, you can support us that way as well. All right. All right. All right. So a lot going on, but I want to get to our guest um, who has been kindly waiting while I get through the rigmarole of my show. Um, so let me get this up in here. I'm going to have to kind of do a few things at once once I bring them through. Y'all know I'm, I'm, I tend to have sound issues, so I want to make sure we don't. But I want to introduce the brother who reached out to me not long ago. We had a chance to communicate over Facebook. And, um, you know, I appreciated the conversation because he actually was bringing some information to bear that uh, is often swept under the rug, as I said. 
And I much appreciate it, uh, not only that he's willing to talk about it, but that he's done extensive research in this area prior to just, uh, you know, the last few weeks or whatnot. So, you know, what I want to do is bring in one Professor Samuel Vincent Jones, professor of law, associate dean and one of the co the Chicago's one of Chicago's noted public uh, intellectuals. I uh, wanted to mention a few things about him. All right. Uh, as long as my screen is going to cooperate here. Because it is actually. Acting up here. My apologies. It ain't a show unless something is happening. Y'all know. Um, and it tends to happen routinely. Uh, okay. So, there we go. Now we went. All right. So, uh, Jones earned his advanced law degree with recognition from Columbia Law School in New York City. He holds a Juris Doctor, cum laude, from Texas Southern University. He's completed his undergraduate degree at Chaminade University of Honolulu, where he majored in philosophy. Uh, in his legal career, uh, prior to joining uh, the tenured law faculty at University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, Jones, pra Jones practiced commercial litigation at K&L Gates, one of the nation's largest law firms. Therefore, he served as senior counsel at AT&T and later as corporate counsel for labor and employment at Blockbuster, uh, then the nation's largest home entertainment company. Uh, Jones was one of two law professors to be the first African-American males in the 117-year history of the John Marshall Law School to receive the rank of full professor. His work has been cited in textbooks and journals at some of the nation's most prestigious institutions, including Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Georgetown, and Berkeley, uh, the U.S. Adversary, uh, U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, as well as the United Nations. Jones has served on the visiting residential faculty at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and the University of Florida Levin College of Law, and has presented his work at some of the world's leading universities again, including Harvard and Oxford. So let me go ahead and bring him up. How you doing, sir? Pretty good. Can you hear me okay? I think we can. I think we can. Uh, let me actually check with the audience. Uh, how is the sound coming across, people? Can anybody uh, give me a one if you can hear both, both of us clearly? Give me a two if there's any kind of sound problem. I want to get this resolved before we dive in. Uh, so just give me a second. Let people come through and uh, let me know. OK, we're getting a lot of ones. So it sounds like everything is looking good. All right. Good. Professor Jones, good to have you in here, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. And thank you for the research you're doing. I want to delve right in if I could. Uh, tell us a little bit about what research you do and how you got into this. Yeah, so uh, the work that uh, you alluded to was the uh, product of a piece that I wrote uh, roughly nine years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And I followed up that piece with, with additional publications, but the piece was called Invisible Man, The Conscious Neglect of Men and Boys and the War on Human Trafficking. Okay. And in that piece, what I communicate is that males uh, represent, you know, at least half of the uh, victims of human trafficking and sex trafficking in the United States. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I uh, published that research, I, I could tell you when I presented it and when I discussed it, many people would roll their eyes. You know, they called me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, misogynistic for focusing on male victims of sex trafficking and and and, and claiming that that uh, uh, males represented uh, such a significant uh, population of victims of, of uh, uh, sexual offenses. And just recently, as you know, uh, Johns Hopkins University just issued its own report where mm -hmm. it, where it also found that uh, boys actually uh, are more likely to be victims of adult sexual violence than girls, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this was, this was very good to see a university with just virtually unlimited research uh, agree with me. And I would say that in the last several years, the State Department has acknowledged that males represent at least half 
of uh, uh, sex trafficking victims in the United States. So, wow. Uh, wow, I feel pretty good about where my research is now. And and we've had some discussions, you and I, about what really triggered this. It was just a personal experience. You know, I was out on a, you know with my my girlfriend once years ago, and uh, you know I saw a little boy uh, selling candy. And he seemed to have a distressed look on his face. He claimed to be uh, a Boy Scout. And he had these, this uh, lady and man with him. And I asked him a question about his Boy Scout organization. He couldn't answer. He just looked at them. It was, it was almost as if he was following the script. Yeah. I gave him a couple of bucks, but it, it never really set well with me. And I'm talking a little boy. I'm talking probably about, you know, five, six years old. Wow. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, I didn't want to you know, against my better judgment. I didn't want to ruin the date. I didn't want to, you know, mess up, you know, our date night, just, you know, being, uh, you know, being obsessed about it. So I said, you know, maybe I'm just overreacting. I mean, I, right. and then, you know, days later, the boy is dead, you know, wow. and I have been, I was haunted by that. And, uh, hmm. not, and, and, and I, I don't, I, I don't even know if I've even forgiven myself, even this, this, even today for that. So I've been, you, you, you to, saw him in the news or is that what it yes, was? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I saw the report. So, wow. uh, and what I realized is that this happens, you know, quite frequently, but it's, it's, it's woefully underreported in the media. The media just, just does not focus on crimes against, uh, boys and the huge number of of boys, particularly black boys, who are missing or victim of crimes, because most of the time we are looked at as uh, offenders, you know, yeah. and that feeds the media narrative and to some degree sells ratings. Now, you've been at least doing this for over a decade. Yes. You said that in many instances you had people, you know, calling you all kinds of slurs misogynist this and that are these happening like on the street or are these or are these incidents happening in the academy unfortunately they happen in the academy uh you, you know it's it's really interesting i mean i will be invited to a conference on human trafficking to present my work and literally while i'm talking certain people will just get up and walk away before i even you know, walk out and get out of their chairs or they roll their eyes or yeah. it, it was really uh it was very striking back then and because no one was really addressing human trafficking uh, uh, from a male victim perspective. It was it was really looked at as something that was almost exclusively uh, 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 a crime that almost exclusively, excuse me, affected uh, women and girls. Yeah. And uh, from this from that sort of narrative, uh, you are able to gain a lot of funding and a, and a lot of uh, attention, you know, by, by, you know, promoting that narrative. I would also say there was also a push that the, <clears throat> the victim of human trafficking, the iconic victim was a blonde haired blue eyed woman. Yeah. And my research revealed that that simply was not true, that most of the victims around the world were actually women and girls of color. Uh, well, I, I should say most of the women who were victims of overwhelmingly most of the women or female victims of human trafficking were women and girls of color. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 if you would um, take us a little bit through um, some of the early data you you started to find and, and really just, especially over the last decade, what did you find your research kind of evolving into in terms of the direction the data was taking you? What, what did you begin to discover? Uh, early on, and then how did that develop over time? Yes, it's, uh, it's a great question. You know, actually, it's been disappointing uh, where, where my data has taken me, and, I, and I'll get to that. Uh, well, it, roughly 10 years ago, it was pretty clear that the media was just turning a blind eye to male uh, victims. What I found that in virtually every major city in the United States, uh, every study that had been conducted uh, revealed that uh, boys represented about half of the child prostitutes in major cities. Um, I also discovered uh, that child pornography rings, whenever the FBI or federal agencies or state agencies raided, you know, a child pornography ring or, or stole computer, I mean, uh, confiscated computers. Yeah. The majority of the child victims depicted in the images and videos were boys. 
Okay. And this was not something that was publicized, but the data in the arrest records were clear. And, and uh, uh, it was, it was, it was quite troubling that the media was not really, uh, uh, was, I, I would say they're virtually ignoring it, you know, yeah. what yeah. I also uh, discovered was that the funding, uh, uh, yes. yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, that, that goes into shelters, uh, all around the country, federal funding, and I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Yes. yes. Uh, over 90 something percent of the funding was earmarked exclusively for women and girls. And so boy, male victims of human trafficking had nowhere to go. As a matter of fact, when I was interviewed, I was uh, invited to be on a panel with a federal judge who had the uh, one of the uh, federal commissions on human trafficking. And she flatly told me uh, and told the audience while we were at the panel, no one was really talking about boys. So when I started talking, I said, you know, my research, you know, revealed that, you know, at least half of the victims are, are, are males. So then she said, and this is a federal judge, she said, uh, uh, frankly, I will say that most of the uh, victims that appear before me in court are males. And this was a federal judge saying this, but I can't find shelters for them. I don't know what to do for them because I, we don't have programs that really address male victims of, of uh, sexual offenses and sex crimes, particularly sex trafficking. So it was very, very troubling. Uh, I also found that first responders, because of the media driven narrative that almost that all victims are almost exclusively females, they don't look for males. They could walk right by a, a child victim of human trafficking or a male victim of, of human trafficking or sex trafficking, not even know it. They're not trained to recognize uh, characteristics of a boy who's in trouble, you know. And there's been instances where boys have told police officers, I'm in trouble. This person kidnapped me. And please just say, uh, what are you talking about? The person comes to say, oh, this is I'm his, I'm his guardian. He's just acting up. I'm just disciplining him now. He's trying to tell a story. Police officer drives off. You know, so it, it's very problematic. Before we continue, I want you to yeah, I want you to move a little over more over to your left so we can get you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Um, and I, you just made you sparked a few random thoughts at the same time because I remember uh, they reported on that when Jeffrey Dahmer actually had absolutely a man of color, you know, run out of his house and he they, they actually made it. To a police squad car, I believe, and Dahmer said, "Oh no, he's just you know a ward of mine or whatever." And the police sent him back with Dahmer uh, in that kind of instance. So that kind of came to mind. But also, when you talk about you know the ways in which you know we've been learned, we've been, we've been taught, we've been conditioned to see things only a certain way. Uh, I find that in a lot of different areas. Like when we talk about you know rape, for example. You know, because we've only seen, particularly in popular culture, we've only seen rape happen in one way. You know, we tend to be oblivious to, you know, how it can happen in other ways that victimize other demographics, particularly boys and men. And when you introduce the data, you get such pushback and resistance. But I think one of the areas you hit on that really undergirds this resistance is funding, you know, and how much funding goes into establishing um, these institutions and you know that continue to focus on just how this impacts people only in one way and leaves boys with absolutely nothing. Um, it might be said that the only institution they have available to them later on in life is prison. But uh, you know, please continue because I'm, I'm you know, it, it, it's it's one thing to kind of know about you know what you're talking about, but to still have it confirmed, it, you know, it, it it still hurts my heart to hear. Uh, yes, yeah, it's very disappointing. Uh, and, and one of the things I think is important to note is that there are hundreds of organizations who receive, uh, you know, vast amounts of funding yeah. uh, for yeah. their programs. They are able to hire employees. They are able to buy buildings or uh, at least properties. And uh, so it's it, you get a lot of resistance when you start presenting the data, essentially when you start telling the truth, because it runs quite contrary to their narrative, but it also compromises the amount of funding that, at least in their view, that they will receive, you know? And uh, one of the things that's also, uh, to go back to the 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 uh, example you gave us about Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, one of the things that is very important to note that many 
boys are in foster care all around the country, particularly, yes. you know, boys of color. Yeah. And many of them suffer tremendous amounts of uh, sexual abuse. When they tell the caseworkers or the social workers what's happening to them, their claims are simply dismissed as stories, as, as oh gosh, oh, now here's another story. Okay, you don't want to go to school. You don't want to live here because you were disciplined or they're making you eat your vegetables and stuff. And so their cries are routinely ignored by social services all around the country. And if you are somebody who was a sexual predator, uh, uh, and there is a lot of research out there that indicates that foster parents routinely uh, sexually abuse uh, children, particularly boys. Uh, listen, you 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 go after a black boy. You go after somebody who is likely to be disbelieved by the institution. So you know, sexual violence against boys, particularly boys of color, and especially black boys, who oftentimes looked at as the perpetrators of sexual offenses rather than the victims. Right. Really right. go uh, ignore it. Absolutely. Um, goodness, it, you made me think of the. You know, actually, the the article that you and I met on Facebook about was one. It was a was you know one of the few articles that actually covered this, and it was a journalist who was also a mother uh, talking about being introduced to this data. You know, because she has she had a daughter and a, and a son, and she was saying that she was prepared to deal with a daughter. I, I covered it. I covered that article on my show here, uh, but I don't have it in front of me at the moment. But she talked about really just being shocked at the data um, in regard to how it impacted her boys. But then it went on a strange turn where, you know, she spent the it was a very long piece. And she spent the majority of it talking about boys who violate other boys. And what I found interesting is, although I appreciated that the data was being put out, there was so much she just dropped a few things and left you know she talked about she mentioned in like one sentence that you know adults violate boys more than any other group and then she just jumped into you know this whole dynamic of boys and other boys and i wondered i said you know this looks to me like you know even when somebody is introduced to the data they're they're grappling with it they have to find a way to put it back into a framework that fits the sensibilities they've been conditioned to have in the last few decades rather than actually deal with the overwhelming, you know, impact of the data. What have you seen this happen before? Or what, 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 what have you noticed? Right. So some people, for whatever reason, emotionally, uh, psychologically, they're, they're just oriented towards the female victim, male culprit conception of the or view of the world. Yeah. Males are simply perpetrators or culprits of, of harm, females of victims. Yeah. So whenever they and so everything, you, whenever you look at violence or you look at harm in the United States or around the world, uh, they are just oriented towards perceiving males as being the source yeah. of that harm, of that violence. Yeah. So when you see data or you receive data that runs that that clearly indicates that boys um, are. Uh, more susceptible to being victims of sexual violence by adults, right? Immediately, there is a sort of psychological and emotional insulation that they simply can't help to immediately yeah. say, to, to put us back into a box that yeah. male culprit, perpetrator uh, slash female victim uh, 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 narrative. And so by saying, well, boys are sexually assaulting boys, OK, and men of sexually assaulting boys. OK, now you again, you shift, you, you're shifting, you, you're taking away that victim title again. No, you can't be victim. Right. You, you're not allowed to claim be a victimization. You are not allowed to conceptually be looked at as a victim. Mm. All right. Because victim is almost like a prize nowadays. And so yes. they don't want that. And so by reframing it, repositioning it, at least conceptually, yeah. they retain the dominant, you know, uh, uh, role as victims and men again looked at as the perpetrator of harm or males as the perpetrator of harms of perpetrators of of sexual violence and that's why that happens and so again it, 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 again and I and I talk about this in my publications our allegiance to the uh, male perpetrator of female uh, victim narrative has really hurt us in a very well way and prevented us from. Uh, uh, successfully curtailing uh, uh, crime in the United States, particularly sex crimes like sex trafficking and uh, sexual assault. Right. 
And it definitely has serious funding implications to challenge this because the question eventually becomes, well, if half the victims are boys and all of the institutional support is going to girls, at some point we have to be in, begin to balance that, which means resources then get taken from established entities that have grown quite comfortable getting it. And that in and of, in and of itself can become a problem. So you can see the, the you know, the under the table fighting that, that you can, uh, that comes about simply from, for, from raising these issues. But uh, yeah, something it, you, it's, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Okay, so so th there's two things there. So you're exactly right, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's the funding, you know, for the victim, but it's also the law enforcement piece. And this is why mm. I am coming out with a uh, another piece called Invisible Boy, which is a a, a, a which will supplement Invisible Man. And right. in this piece, I'm going to talk specifically about the way law enforcement actually targets males as pimps, particularly black males. Wow. And what we're seeing all around the country is that when law enforcement are, you know, tr it, it, purportedly trying to take steps to curtail sexual violence in their cities or in their jurisdictions or curtail sexual trafficking, right? They are targeting black males as pimps. And the, the ladies, the uh, children who are oftentimes the prostitutes are telling them, I don't have a pimp. And wow. that person you're talking about, I don't even know that person. Wow. And there's research out there that indicates that the police are taking these prostitutes to buildings, to departments or whatever the case and saying, we charge you unless you implicate him. Wow. Okay. And this and, and so we're seeing in certain jurisdictions, 80 to 90 percent of the people arrested as human traffickers or sex traffickers are black males, even when the the actual prostitutes, the people engaged in the conduct are telling the law enforcement that's not true. All right. But this is how they are there. So that not only is this a threat to funding, you know, for victims. It's also will force the law enforcement machine, which is a huge machine. It is a mega billion dollar in industry in this country, yeah. law enforcement, uh, which in some the way, which which in some degrees you could characterize as you know uh, uh, enforcement of a sort of narrative or or reinforcement or certain design that sees criminals as you know men of color. Right. Uh, they have to rethink reposition their thoughts, reposition their resources, because wait a minute, so black males are not really the majority of pimps? I mean, it really in some jurisdictions, 80, 90% of the people they're arresting are black males who they are calling pimps. And in, I, in, in my next publication, I'm going to point out instances where there's testimony where they say the person's just standing on the street and they says hello to someone, okay, they're, they're your pimp. Wow. You know, and so, uh, that's the other angle here. So when you start introducing this data and getting it out there, it really changes not only the funding for the programs, but also the funding that law enforcement departments and agencies receive to combat human trafficking, because now you're, you're no longer going to be authorized to just grab black males off the street and mm. call them pimps. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of them sitting in jail because of that. And I will say that the. Washington Post and a couple of newspapers have uh, have uh, started uh, publishing uh, some of these reports. So it, it's been very helpful that, uh, uh, you know, national media, you know, vehicles are starting to 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 get wind of this, this, this problem that we have in the United States. But I tell you, uh, people like you, your work, you, you, you are at the vanguard of these issues because this is what we need. You know, uh, because many people don't know about this problem and many of the other problems that you address on your show. Right. So it was very helpful as an academic and a researcher when I hear you pointing to data and having these kinds of discussions, because most of us really not me, not you, of course, but most of America really sees in, uh, or receives information pertaining to black males always yeah. in the negative. Absolutely. You know, again, supporting that male culprit, male perpetrator sure. slash female. Sure. And I and I want you to continue to delve into the to to your findings. But I do want to ask this: Do you think? And this, I don't want to take it too far into the left, but 
a lot of what I do is a media analysis. As, as far-fetched as it may seem, do you think the entire era of the 70s, most especially, where black men became associated with pimping and pop culture, right? Do you think that has anything to do with how easily people digest those narratives to justify incarcerating black males as pimps? Do you think that media relationship is at all at play in here in terms of that? Absolutely. It's 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 not only is it at play, I mean it's it it represents one of the core reasons that it continues to happen. Uh uh and I and I take the position that it is so glaring you you you, you can only assume that it's it's purposeful. Wow. Uh there is simply an image of the black male right. uh as a uh, as sexually animalistic, as sexually violent, as someone who who is sexually immoral, uh, who is beastly, uh, that has uh, permeated, you know, the American culture for quite some time. Yeah. And when you look at uh, black exploitation, black exploitation films of the 70s and, and reports and so forth, this all centered around that narrative. And it is what authorizes law enforcement to snatch black males off the street, you know, regardless of what age and snap and 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 rob families of their fathers and of their husbands. It is what allows uh, women to sexually victimize black boys and then claim, I was the victim. He he wooed me, I was tricked. And you're talking about adult women and you're talking about 11, 12 year old boys, but in yeah. many cases they're younger than that. Yeah. And, but this is what allows them to appeal to that narrative, you know, because of our conceptions. Yeah. And when I say our, I mean the public's conceptions, uh, 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 of, of black males, which is fueled by this 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 media uh, driven image of a uh, black masculinity, which which I think is also in, uh, impacted too by some of the data we've seen, where boys, black boys in particular, are seen as much older than they are, even as young as five years old, right? So we we know that that plays into it, not only the accusation but the believability. You know, when it, when when this goes before a jury, if it goes before a jury, and maybe that's something I should ask. But just in terms of how how easily people can digest that idea, but do these cases get before you? Like, what generally happens when we look at this? When people are in, are arrested, right? So, so two two things there. Uh, the the jury is a very interesting piece to this, mm-hmm. and as well as appearance. Not only do black boys tend to be perceived as more old as as older and more aggressive, but also they there is this belief that black boys really don't suffer pain like other children. Yeah. That they're more they're more resi- resilient. Like you can hit them or beat them or it didn't hurt them and that they don't really suffer psychological harm and emotional harm like other children. So right. you can, you know you you almost have to be more barbaric and more violent with them because that's the only language and the way to communicate with them. Yeah. Right? So it, it's the it's, it's the it's the physical attribute, but it's also this these these notions of like an a, of a subhuman, you know, mm. uh, 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 and, and so it, it is very problematic. The, the 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 problem with the jury is that the jury walks in with these these uh, preconceived notions of, of black males. That's number one, and number two, many of these cases never reach the jury. Ninety mm. something percent of your criminal cases are going to be the result of a plea deal. Yeah. Where a black male is told, listen, we could yeah. take you to trial, but if you force us to have a trial, you're going to be looking at 100 years. Sign this piece of paper, go to jail for 10 years yeah. Uh, yeah. and get out. And so if you are poor and you have no resources and you're relying on a public defendant who, who has so many cases and barely knows your name, mm-hmm. you're saying, OK, I'm facing 100 years uh, of for something I didn't do, or I can just do this 10 years and maybe, you know, take my luck on uh, parole and, and getting out and you mm-hmm. have stuff and you sign the paper, you know? Exactly. And and so it's, it's, it's a, it's a shame. I mean, and we hear stories about this all the time of black males uh, confessing to crimes only to find years later after they've been locked up, you know, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years that the DNA indicates that they're innocent. And not only does the does the DNA indicate that they're innocent, it also indicates that the prosecutor in many instances had exculpatory evidence, meaning that they knew that there was evidence that someone else committed the crime. Yes. But they still will grab that black body 
And as uh, there's a famous line of one of Denzel Washington movies, I think it's, it's, it's Hurricane, where he says, any black man will do when they came to arrest him, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's, a, it's a very real uh, uh, circumstance in the United States. Right no, absolutely. And that, that, that speaks to the power of even the accusation, right? I don't care if you're a professor. I don't care if you're just an innocent man walking down the street. The accusation has such power because of that, you know, that that attack on black males that for many of us, you know, it, it it's a war to make sure you're not arbitrarily accused of something that you didn't do. You know what I mean? Simply because you know how much that idea has been digested and how easily it translates to time incarcerated. It can translate to that very easily. So, you know, but and, and the social mobility piece. And so there's research out there now that indicates if you are a black male, even if you have a PhD, a law degree, a sure. medical degree, went to, uh, you know, great schools or have a great job have married with children, you do not experience the social mobility that other uh, uh, men uh, in your position experience. Yeah. You actually experience alarming levels of anxiety and, and depression mm -hmm. because of the way in which society reacts to the black male, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and if you are a father of a black male, right. Yeah. Yeah. The argument could be made in this research being done by an African American female at, at the university of North Carolina, Greensboro, uh, where she talks about a specific brand of racial trauma that yeah. black boys suffer similar to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because of all the constant images of shooting and the way black boys are, are treated and, and the way that narrative is perpetrated, where you're never off, you're never relaxed. From the moment yeah. you leave your house, you are yeah. under suspicion simply by being a black male. And so that carries with it a certain level of, well, you, you're certainly carrying on your shoulders a certain level of racial fatigue or, or racial trauma. Many of them, many, a matter of fact, there's a study that she conducted. Uh, she found that an overwhelmingly large percentage of black boys in the country today can point to, have seen somebody they know killed or beaten badly, right, as a child. You know, and that the perpetrator of the violence in many cases, law enforcement or in many cases, a, a relative who sexually abused a boy or, you know, there's no repercussions. There's no accountability whatsoever. Yeah. So they develop a sense of of uh, margin, internal margin laces where, where they know that they don't their lives don't mean as much. Right. You know, so when they are victims of sexual violence, many of them, have, they suffer in silence. They yeah. begin to say, who's going to believe me, you know, and yeah. one person and then the, the, the perpetrator will oftentimes say, if you say something, I'm going to tell them you stole. I'm going to tell them you did this. And right. so that accusation that you're coming, you're talking about that yeah. has power is actually used as a vehicle for exacting crime and violence against the black boy. You know, yes. yes. You know? And so it's a very real uh, circumstance in, in our culture. And I, and I wanted to go, I'm going to go back a little bit and then I'm going to present you with some information and see what, what it jars uh, in you. Appreciate that, Kill, kill Deuce. Um, you, you know, there was something you were saying a moment ago when you talked about boys being able to be abused and people don't believe that they hurt. This goes back to, an, you know, and I'm telling the, the public, appreciate that, Barry, appreciate uh, the support. Uh, there's an old stereotype about what they call pickaninnies. Right. Which has to do with, you know, the stereotype view of black children. And it promoted the idea that black children were unfeeling and couldn't be hurt uh, and, and along the same lines you're talking about. So this idea about, you know, our children being more threatening uh, at younger ages, but also incapable of feeling pain. Not only does it go back uh, really towards slavery, it even impacts us in the medical field where, where, you know, they've done studies on nurses and doctors administering pain meds and giving black patients less based on this random assumption that we don't feel pain the way others do. So you're dead on when you talk about that. Um, but I found a, a piece you may even be familiar with off of savethechildren.org. And it was talking particularly about uh, the myths and facts regarding uh, child trafficking. And so, you know, now there's there's a number of them. So I'm just going to, you know, read them at random to you and just see, you know, what 
what you can talk to us about in relation to this. Uh, and they're not in any particular order. Um, but the first one is the is myth. Only girls and women are victims of human trafficking. And it says fact boys and men are just as likely to be victims of human trafficking as girls and women. I appreciate that, Vernon. Appreciate that, BGS. Um, oh, there we go. And then, uh, and then it says girls and boys are often subject to different types of trafficking. Uh, appreciate that, Rick. Um, for instance, girls may be trafficked for forced marriage and sexual exploitation, while boys may be trafficked for forced labor or recruitment into armed groups. Can you speak to us about, um, you know, the types of trafficking that that takes place with boys? Absolutely. So first, let, let me be very clear about this. Boys are suffer from sex trafficking uh, just as much, if not more than than girls. So that 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 right there is the hallmark of the piece that was that you and I talked about that was recently published. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so some of these organizations, uh, they they are still married to this idea that, oh, well, yeah, boys can be victims of, of human trafficking, but girls really are suffering from sexual crap. They're the ones being then raped and, you know, sexually assaulted. What I'm saying is, well, no, you're right. Partially boys also are being raped and sexually assaulted uh, at, at particularly at, a, at higher rates uh, uh, than girls by adults in the child pornography rings are targeting boys more so than girls or at least depicting just as many boy victims as girl right. victims in their footage and images, although a lot of the rates indicate that the majority of, of, of are boys. So that's one. So the, the sex trafficking, my position is that the numbers are equal. If, but but again, like Johns Hopkins and, and myself and others, uh, boys actually represent actually a, a majority of the sexual the, the victims of sexual uh, sex trafficking. Excuse me. But they are correct. They're as a general rule, human trafficking uh, really is divided into a lot of different categories. And you do see an alarming number of boys around the world who are actually snatched and forced to serve as child soldiers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're also forced to serve as, as, as child laborers. And one of the things that my research uh, reveals Invisible Man is, is that if you look at uh, 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 the farms like the United States has one that runs a mega billion dollar agriculture industry industry. You know, we, we our agricultural uh, sector in the United States is vastly under discussed, yeah. but it is a mega billion dollar industry. You know, mm. you convert you can go to a store in the United States and, and, and buy any find anything you want. That's because of, you know our agricultural arm in a lot of ways and of course imports and exports but we have a tremendous number of farms in the united states what people don't know is that a significant portion of the people working those those farms are virtual slaves that you are not required to pay them minimum wage mm -hmm. many of them are foreigners they fall under a special category uh, of worker mm -hmm. and many of them work uh uh 15, 20 hours a day and receive, receive per hour less than minimum wage. Yeah. And many of them are children. Many of them are abused while they're working on these on these farms. Many of them suffer tremendous. Uh, many of these children suffer tremendous health problems because the, 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 there's a tremendous amount of uh, insecticide and chemicals associated with, with work, with doing farm work. And so uh, one of the uh, most underdiscussed areas, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of criminal literature or criminal jurisprudence is the degree to which children are trafficked to work on many of these farms, and many of these farmers have children. Okay, okay. and uh, uh, that's another area that is that is woefully under discussed in the media when we talk about human trafficking. You also have warehouses. You know, you have uh, uh, massage parlors. You have clean up maids and stuff. Uh, you have uh, boys doing all kind of performing all kind of manual labor all over the place. I mean, the number of of uh, victims of child uh, trafficking is just huge. Um, uh, but many cases, 
there's interconnectivity between sex and, and, and labor because yeah. the, the person who was trafficking for labor is oftentimes a victim of, of sexual violence. Absolutely. And I will say this if I didn't mention it, uh, one of the things that we don't talk about in this country is missing persons in connection yeah. with trafficking. Yes. And there have been a number of studies yeah. that indicate that when you look at the population of missing people in the United States, yes. black males, and particularly black boys, represent a disproportionately large number of missing people in the yeah. United States, and the media simply ignores the problem. Yeah, we saw the article a couple of years ago that said it was up to 1.5 million black males, and none of it, at any point that I can recall, did they bring up trafficking. As a right. Issue. Right. So, so where'd they go? Who, who, right. So they didn't just disappear. Matter of fact, I think the title of one of the articles I read on that was 1.5 million black men just disappeared. Yeah. Or, or, what they, or black males just disappeared. What I'm saying is that this is directly related to trafficking. Yeah. They didn't just vanish, you right. know. And also, I will say this, and I, and I will be remiss if I did not say this, but uh, it is an area that's very dear to me. And we really need to talk about this in the context of human trafficking. And that is the, the black men who, who are oftentimes found dead and their organs are missing. And it, it, I, I can't even believe the reports about black men, the, the bodies of young boys and, and black males being found and their organs are missing and law enforcement doesn't have an answer and nobody knows what happened. These are very real developments in the United States of America where right. you are literally finding human beings um, who are missing. And all of a sudden, when you do find them, their organs are missing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, let me before I move to the next myth, let me ask a random question. It, you know, we generally when we think about uh, trafficking of any sort, we usually think of, you know, some stranger or maybe even some, you know, undercover organization that's doing this or something of that nature. But I'm just curious if whether it be juvenile detention centers or, or prisons, if you're arbitrarily incarcerated, especially for something you didn't do, um, and then given a plea deal as your only realistic option and then put to work, is trafficking ever associated with institutions, penal institutions in that manner in terms of how it's conceptualized or no? No, no, it's, it's, it's never. I mean, you're, that is one. That is a very powerful question uh, because that goes back to the the Thirteenth Amendment and our, our conception yes. of slavery. Yes. You know, uh, yes. and and many people are not aware of this this rule within our Constitution. But essentially, sl when slavery was abolished, abolished mm -hmm. criminals were the exception. So yes. if you could bestow upon somebody the title of felon or criminal. Right. They are an exempt from anti-slave laws in the United States, which Absolutely. means that I can simply arrest that person, convict them or get them to a plea to a, 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 a criminal charge that makes them a felony. And if, when they when they are incarcerated, I can put them to work. Absolutely. And many corporations in the United yeah. States are making a tremendous amount of profit, yeah. you know, exactly. off of prison labor. And have been because you can go back to Reconstruction and find, you know, particularly black men who were who were incarcerated, especially throughout the South, uh, and arbitrarily put to work, often till the till, till their deaths, right? Yes. Where they were, and the charges were, you know, charges like loitering, you know what I mean? Even something as trivial as hurting someone's feelings, you know, as a trumped up charge. And then you saw judges and and whatnot being paid basically by whatever local industry, railroad, you know, char, you know, coal, whatever, my coal mining, and then seeing these black men incarcerated for these trumped up charges and spending the rest of their lives working to death. And yet, because of the way trafficking has been articulated in our media, it, it's primarily sex and it's primarily girls and, and women. And those are the only, and, and I'm not saying that that should be ignored. I'm simply saying that I think we need to open that definition up to however it presents itself in the lives of boys and men. So if we, if we were to say, okay, based on how we define trafficking, I would consider black men arbitrarily incarcerated in reconstruction, you know, and put to labor for the rest of their lives as a form of trafficking. You know what I mean? I would argue that and, and really begin to look at how that shapes or reshapes our conversation about trafficking. But again, you know, some of these definitions are so, 
so well ensconced. They're so structured in how we think about them. It's almost an uphill battle just to be able to say boys experience it, let alone how does this, how do boys experiences, men's experiences reshape how we, def how we even define it and how long it's been happening, right? Because we only talk about trafficking as long as it's in the last couple of years. But if we can go back to the 1800s, now what? You know what I mean? How, how does that change the discussion? Um, I mean, you're exactly right, but you just raised a point that uh, uh, I actually didn't mention, and which is a major problem in this in this area, and that is the way we define trafficking and the way we define sex crimes in the United States and around yeah. the world. Yeah. Uh, what my research revealed, and I'm talking about a visible man, was that in many countries, males simply could not be a victim of sexual trafficking because of the definitions. Right. And males right. could not be a victim of rape or sexual assault because of the definition. Yes. And so sexual assault and rape, you know, was simply a product of a male perpetrator yes. and a female victim. And right. so when the statistics are revealed, people are saying, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, 99, you know, uh, 0.9 or 100 percent of the of victims are, are women. Well, that's because by your definitional standards, you can't even male victims are simply ignored. They are invisible. Absolutely. And frankly, that's why I called my uh, publication Invisible Man and why my next yeah. one will be called Invisible Boy, because uh, law, law plays a tremendous role in perpetrating uh, this th these myths that you're, you're you're talking about, and a law plays a, a very heavy role in the, in the, the alarming level of uh, harm that uh, black males uh, suffer in the United States. In ma many cases, at, you know, we have to accept that in the United States, our laws for a long time have been very immoral. You know, I mean, yeah. we are a country where slavery was at one point legal. You know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. You know, law is not all. Law, law oftentimes is not synonymous with morality. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, there there was a there was a documentary that my campus. I was asked on campus to present. It was called "My Masculinity Helps," and the documentary was basically about black men uh, doing more to help black women against rape, holding other men accountable, so on and so forth. But you could see in which the the way the data that they were looking at shaped the narrative of the documentary because. When, when they put it on the screen, it said 99% of rapes are committed against women, but they were going with very old data, right? This was prior to the 2012 FBI redefining of rape, actually removing one gender from the definition and then just in focusing on penetration, violation, so on and so forth. So when 99% when of the rapes are committed against women by men, yeah, it, it makes sense that you would make a documentary about men needing to do more. But when you find out you know, when you open this definition definition up and when you actually begin to include the fact that the United States incarcerates more of its citizens than any other country and the overwhelming percentage of those incarcerated are male and statistically black male. And you can see the way even just incarceration by itself impacts sexual assault and rape. You really have to change the nature of the discussion, uh, you know, and, and of course, that doesn't exclude what women and girls tend to do to men and boys. If you look at uh, Dr. Tommy Curry and Ebony Utley's paper, She Touched Me, um, and look at the data, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of how young our boys are and how often they tend to be violated by older girls and women, we find that there is a, there is a serious case for these statistics being readjusted, reevaluated in ways that we haven't learned to do yet and change the discussion from there. But, you know, if people don't yeah. really do that and we're comfortable with just, um, you know, kind of maligning men and leaving it there as if somehow, you know, we just have this evil gene uh, simply because we exist. And it's ridiculous. But absolutely. And, and one of the things I like about the movie Anton Fisher is yes. because there was a part in that movie where he simply acknowledges uh, uh, familial sexual assault, where black boys, <laughs> black males are routinely sexually assaulted by women in their families and have nobody to, to, to really dis to disclose that to or talk about. And it has a tremendous amount of uh, 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 it has a, a tremendous impact, psychological yeah. and emotional impact on their on the way in which they see the world. And unfortunately, some of these uh, victims of sexual violence, these black boys go on to sexually assault women and girls yeah. because they themselves were sexually assaulted as a child, you know, mm -hmm. by uh, uh, a, a, a woman. And there's a lot of data that that really reveals that that cycle and is very uh, unfortunate that we don't really speak about the, these issues 
you know, one of the things that is very important to understand is, you know, a lot of these movies, a lot of people that we don't really think about as being victims of, of, of uh, sexual violence, you know, uh, are really shamed into silence as, yeah. a, as a black male. It's yeah. actually, it is, it, it, it's, it, you almost begin to see what the research reveals that they all, they, they, they begin to feel as though, well, I must not be a man. Yes. Yeah, because being masculine, being a man means being uh, invulnerable, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, able to protect yourself, you yeah. know, or you don't want to subject yourself to ridicule or condemnation and so forth. And these are children, you know, yeah. and so, again, it goes, you know, and so it's, it's a very real problem uh, in, in our community. And quite frankly, uh, what I always say when I hear people say that uh, uh, men should do more to to protect uh, women and um, girls from rape, I always, you know, remind people, I think that we should do everybody, women and men should do everything that we can do to protect anybody from right. rape. And so, or sexual assault, any violation of human dignity, because that's what solves the problem. Because the moment you start positioning it as a female centered uh, uh, right. offense, you are ignoring a wide number, if not the majority of sexual sure. victims in the United sure. States. So, but and, then, and, but, but, and that's why we need to actually be aware of the tropes in terms of yes. how different it may present, how different the narrative may be for a boy versus a girl, for a man versus a woman. We have to be able to explore those particular tropes and narratives in detail uh, so that we can we can better better you know identify these various groups, these various demographics and how they experience it. And I also want to say to what you said a moment ago about this idea of invulnerability, right? Shout out to Dr. Ronald Neal. If you haven't checked his channel, uh, definitely go do so here on YouTube. He did a presentation yesterday, I believe, not earlier today, um, my days are blending together, but he did a presentation where he talked about Rick Ross as a symbol of this black male and vulnerability. And he began to deconstruct this idea for the sake of actually looking at the vulnerabilities we experience and navigate daily. So check out Dr. Ron O'Neill's latest piece on his channel on YouTube dealing with invulnerability. But um, OK, so one of the next uh, myths that I have here is that uh, um, um yeah, it says uh, myth. People being trafficked are physically unable to leave or are held against their will. Fact, trafficking can involve force, but people can also be trafficked through threats, coercion or deception. People in trafficking situations can be controlled through drug addiction, violent relationships, manipulation, lack of financial independence or isolation from family or friends, in addition to physical restraint or harm. Any thoughts? Yes. So uh, I'm glad you brought that piece up. Uh Drug addiction is one of the primary means by which people lure children and young adults. Uh, you start you start interacting with the child or the young adult. You get them hooked on 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 a particular drug, and then you abuse them. It's 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 it's, it's real simple. The other thing that I will say is that runaways, children who run away uh, from home, are highly vulnerable to becoming uh, a, a child uh, victims of, of human trafficking. They're on the street, they're trying to survive. And so they engage in what we call survival sex, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, boys represent a high number of, uh, particularly black boys who are engaging in uh, the survival sex and who are oftentimes using drugs simply to, 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 alleviate some of the pain that they are suffering. They simply have no family resources, no yeah. financial resources. Yeah. They're not able to really appeal to uh, law enforcement for help. There are no programs for black boys like you know, like we've talked about over 90 something percent of, of the programs are for women and girls. So where do they go? They go to abandoned buildings. They go to gangs. They go to anywhere that they can sleep and that they eat. And oftentimes they're willing to do anything uh, to uh uh, s survive and traffickers, right. you know, sexual predators and so forth. They look for for people like that, and one of the ways in which they control them is through uh, uh, drugs and, and 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 alcohol. The other thing that is important to understand is threats. In the mm -hmm. black community, it's it's known in certain areas of of our country that if you call the police, they're not going to really show up anytime soon, and mm -hmm. that oftentimes if you are threatened with crime or criminal is is threatening you or your mother or your your uh your your sister well what do you do 
a person might say, well, I'll make sure that that threat goes away. But now you work for me and you will go do this. So a lot of times that go do this is not rob a store. A lot of times is commit uh, sexual acts on the behalf of that person. You know, so these are very real uh, 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 techniques that traffickers uh, and sexual predators use. Wow. Wow. Um, Okay, here's another Um, uh, myth. Trafficking involves traveling, transporting or moving a person across borders. Did I read this one? Um, No, no, you didn't. Not yet. Okay. fact, human trafficking is not the same thing as smuggling, which are two terms that are commonly confused. Trafficking does not require movement across borders. In fact, in some cases, a child could be trafficked and exploited from their own home. In the U.S., trafficking most frequently occurs at hotels, motels, truck stops and online. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. So in my piece, uh, Should Consent Matter, I actually go into the distinction. That's another publication that came out, The Invisible Man. I go into the distinction between human trafficking and human smuggling. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly right, that you really do not have to cross international borders at all. But many of the people who are uh, victims of human smuggling or engage in human smuggling or who might pay somebody to be smuggled across the border oftentimes become victims of human trafficking, wow. you know, but one of the most alarming aspects of human trafficking. And when I'm talking about human trafficking, I'm talking about sex trafficking is that oftentimes it is a relative who is trafficking a child and anybody could do a Google search and you will see that oftentimes there is a child who is told to go into a car or go into a room with an adult and that adult pays a parent or an uncle or an aunt, uh, a certain amount of money to have sex with that child. And this is not this is not hidden data. This is simply searching news reports, you know, uh, and you and, and it's a very real problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. But uh, familial trafficking is a very serious problem in, in the United States. Uh, and it's one of the primary means by which child victims, you know, uh, uh, suffer. Talk to us a little bit about the online component, because as you're aware, you know, video games, online activity, especially during COVID, um, you know, uh, where people are confined. Um, it, it, talk to us about the online aspect of trafficking. How does it present to, to children, uh, most especially? And, and how does that translate to trafficking? What, what happens there? Well, you know, the Internet is simply a vehicle for communication and right. and p- many people who are n- not monitoring what their children are doing on the Internet do so at their own risk because you have a number of of uh, traffickers and sexual yeah. predators who are really online targeting children. And for that reason, many police departments, to their credit, have set up stings where they sort of act like a child, you know, uh, uh, they take uh, on a role as a child, you know, they conduct these thing operations. And then when the person shows up to meet the child, they are arrested. This yeah. is a very real issue because the child is literally could be playing a video game, you know, and a lot of times these video games, uh, many people don't see a video game as a social media platform, right? right. So right. with Facebook, you can get on Facebook and you know, you're talking with a lot of different people, right? Sure. Somebody could chime in or talk, uh, and put a comment, you know, enter a comment and you can respond to it. But when we think about online gaming, we really don't really see that as a digital community for people to interact. We think yeah. the child is just playing a game. Right. No, no, right. no, 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 no. Many of these games, many of these digital communities, you're able, somebody is able to come in and communicate. They're able to play with one another. And so these sexual predators oftentimes start to form relationships with these children through these various vehicles online. Next thing you know, hey, well, what do you think about me here or blah, 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 and luring them with all kinds of gifts. And and oftentimes the child is starving for love and protection or for something that they really want. And they want to believe that that person on the other end uh, of that game is going to give them this gift and going to give them this love and and, and so forth. And uh, uh, they wind up agreeing to meet. And and they will be well. we know what will happen when when, when they need, you know. Um, Yes, it's a very real threat. And and, and, and that's why it's important to monitor what the children are doing. 
So you're talking, about, you're, you're talking about attention on a basic level, but to the average parent, they are primed, if at all, I mean, if they're primed at all, they're primed to look, you know, look, to make sure that their girls aren't yeah. leaving the house to go meet somebody. So first, we tend to assume that video games are innocent. There's no issue there. The children are safe as long as they're playing. And then second, if we are going to be uh, concerned and observant about what could happen, we tend to focus on girls. So your son who's playing video games all day and all day and then goes out to go meet a friend could be just as vulnerable to being uh, trafficked as anyone else. Absolutely. Not only is he, is he he's, he's vulnerable, I, I take the position the son is actually more likely, according to the research that, that's out there. And one reason why this occurs is that boys are conditioned to believe that they can't be a sexual trafficking victim or a victim of sexual crime. So if they go play a game with a grown man and they engage in a sexual act with the grown man the, and receive you know money in return for that, the boy is convinced that he's just hanging out, that he's not, you know, he's not a victim. He just did this for money. And so he can go buy more games or he can go buy those sneakers. And, and so now this boy is essentially a child prostitute. But the boy is convinced, oh, I'm just hanging out. Oh, my friend gave me this money or my friend did this. And they're just performing these acts. And so they conceptually, they are conditioned to believe that they simply cannot be victims. And that only happens to girls. Yeah. And meanwhile, they are being victimized just the same as, as as a girl would. And parents are completely oblivious to this aspect of our society. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's not after all, it goes back to this whole question of media. It's not what I've been presented. It's not what I've seen uh, to, you know, in terms of trafficking and rape. It's 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 only happening to one demographic. So why would I need to be concerned? Right. Uh, let me see. So another uh, and, and I'm really asking for you to pull from, uh, you know, your, your primary piece here, Invisible Man. But and, and I'm, I'm not sure how much of Invisible Boy has been completed, but, you know, anything you want to pull from that as well. Um, and I want you to tell us, at, you know, in a moment when we, we begin to close, I want you to tell people where they can find your work. But um, another myth. So myth: traffickers target victims they don't know. Uh, fact, the majority of the time, victims are trafficked by someone they know, such as a family, friend, um, you know, or romantic partner. Now, you spoke about family. Can you talk about romantic partner? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, well, I, I will say with respect to the child trafficking, obviously, the romantic partner piece is, is not a doesn't play a major role. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the romantic partner, uh well, let me let me let me take that back because in Invisible Boy, I do have a section on the way the the way in which uh, sexual uh, sex traffickers and uh, sexual predators use the lure of love to turn a child into a prostitute by convincing them that they love them and that if they engage in this sexual act with this person, that's going to allow that person to give them more money so that they can go off on an island and go buy a mansion somewhere in a different city and so forth. And so this is an investment. If they'll just do this, they can ultimately be together one day, one on one in their own house and have their cars, and have this nice life. They just simply have to make these sacrifices right now. And they wow. begin to tell the child how much they love them and they're making the same sacrifices. As well. So to some degree, romantic partners, and I don't like to use that word with respect to children because yeah, for right, obvious yeah. reasons, right, right. but to some degree, uh, the manipulation of love is playing a significant role uh, in, in, in manipulating the child into engaging in, in, in sexual acts as it, because it is an investment, the child believes, in the future with this person who purportedly loves them when in fact it's just ma manipulation. And this does happen to, to uh, boys as well as 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 girls and there's been tremendous uh stories uh reports out there where boys actually are in love with the school teacher or the uh, female adult who has been uh sexually mm. exploiting them yeah. and the fathers and the mothers are furious with the fact that the boy is psychologically really on the verge of suicide yeah. because they become to realize that it that they love this person. They don't want anything to happen to this person. But meanwhile, they were just a, a sexual object, you know, yeah. simply being manipulated. Uh, in terms of adults. So, so we're, before you sorry. move to adults, uh, on one level, it could also be a perceived romantic partner, right? If you got a 13 year old boy on a video game or on social media who thinks he's talking to another girl his age 
and that being the means. So there's definitely that connection. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's powerful. That's powerful. There was something else you said. Well, I'm going to let you continue, but there was something else you, you said that sparked me, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to find that question and bring it back to you. Can I interrupt? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. So, well, and I, I will just say, uh, uh, with respect to the, the romantic piece in the adults, uh, the, the same techniques that are used against children are oftentimes used against adults as, as well. Yeah. You think a person uh, loves you uh, uh, and wants the best for you, and so you start to engage in certain behaviors in order to please that person. Yeah. <sighs> Man, you have my head swimming. Um, yeah, it's a very, there's a lot out there. There's a lot to unpack with this. And unfortunately, uh, uh, male victims simply, despite representing uh, uh, at least half of all victims of uh, human trafficking, simply their, their victimization, their exploitation simply is ignored, you know, uh, and, and it's, it's very unfortunate. But the data is, is out there and uh, it's just not publicized. It's not really talked about. Uh, but people are conducting studies and they're saying that this is a problem, but no one's really addressing it on a major level. OK. Um, myth. Trafficking primarily occurs in developing countries. Fact. Uh, trafficking occurs all over the world, uh, though the most common forms of trafficking can differ by country. The United States is one of the most active sex trafficking countries in the world where exploitation of trafficking victims occurs in cities, suburban and rural areas. Labor trafficking occurs in the U.S., but at lower rates than most developing countries. Any thoughts? Well, one of the things that that I that really resonated with, with me was the role of the United States. Uh, we we really publish a report every year called the Traffickings in Person Report, where the U.S. State Department and other federal uh, uh, federal agencies will uh, come together compare data and then issue this report. And it's like a report card on various countries around the world and how they're doing with respect to human trafficking and combating human trafficking, I should say. We are one of the worst uh, in the world with respect to combating human trafficking because of the way we approach it. So it's very interesting that we put out this report card, but I will say this, mm. and, and, and I, I don't want to be controversial, but I really have to say this. Okay. Uh, uh, because this is what the this is what I discovered. The State Department was reporting the was re, was was uh, publicizing, you know, the various countries efforts to combat human trafficking and issuing this 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 global report. And it gives a synopsis of each country. And in many countries, they were simply ignoring boy prostitutes. In some countries, it was pretty clear that the number of boy prostitutes were like in the 80s and 90 percent. Like it was like people all around the world traveled to certain countries just to have sex with boys. What I found, and this is not an indictment on her, but what I found in my research is that when uh, Hillary Clinton took over the State Department, a lot of the data related to boys yes. disappeared. Disappeared. Yep. It simply was not reflected in the trafficking in persons report. And I will go a step farther. I wrote a piece called Bachabazi, which talked about Afghanistan, where we we were, we have our military forces in Afghanistan, and they have a practice over there where boys lit, uh, literally are dancing boys. You know, it's accepted that you just grab you you have a wife, and you have a boy on the side that you sleep with, right, and that dances for you, and so forth. And American soldiers were complaining for quite some time that, wait a minute, do you know they're over here sexual assault and raping all of these boys right in front of our eyes? And they mm -hmm. were told, don't interfere. Yeah. Don't yeah. interfere. That's not your mission. And so I noticed this sort of backstep from reporting alarming levels of sexual violence and sexual exploitation and sex trafficking of males around the country sort of just disappear from the trafficking in persons report you know when she when she took over and that's not a personal indictment yeah right, right. she may not even know but it is what i noticed when i yeah. start looking at the the years in which all of a sudden okay uh, uh, what happened to all of the data with respect to the countries who were not really doing anything to combat 
sex trafficking of boys. Now you start to see a little bit of it. And Afghanistan really, you know, because of my research and the reports of a lot of soldiers who were who really couldn't take it, who really lost whose careers were ruined for interfering. Now, because of that news, uh, Afghanistan has gotten some negative attention because of that, that culture of uh, botchivizing. Right. You know, it, this is going to sound a bit off topic, but it, it, it's it is and it isn't because just speaking about a different area of it. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I interviewed a, a brother named uh, Carnell, whose research deals with uh, false paternity. And what I found is there seems to be a, a collective of men who've been doing research in unpopular areas, being maligned, being stereotyped, being called slurs, being dismissed from mainstream conversation. But they've nonetheless persevered and done this work. And I, you strike me to be a part of that collective. And I'm starting to think that there are quite a few in a lot of different areas. And I say that because I'm not looking at your full publication record. I specifically went into my library at Fresno State and I put in your name, Samuel Vincent Jones. Now, I don't know how many Samuel Vincent Jones there are out there publishing on human trafficking. I'm going to assume that there's at least one and that's about it. But, you know, from what I can tell, you are well published on this. Um, you know, you have a, a piece in here. You talked about ending bachi bazi, boy sex slavery and the responsibility to protect doctrine, uh, human trafficking, victim identification, should consent matter, uh, law enforcement and white power. Uh, that's uh, and, uh, an FBI report unraveled. Uh, invisible women have conceptions about femininity led to the global dominance of the female human trafficker. Um, you know, men and boys and ethical demand for social justice. I mean, you are you are well published on this. And yet I get the impression, even in academic circles, that uh, you're seen as, as, as you know, it, it controversial. Uh, you know, you may not even be invited to certain discussions that are really right up your alley in terms of research because they don't want that element of the discussion in it. It, 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 it taints the discussion because it needs to stay on. It, so in, in, is my assessment correct that you are, it, it, do you think there are a, a, a collective of black men, especially who are doing research in unpopular areas that get treated like yourself and, and, and myself as well. But uh, yes, uh, you, you know, unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, obviously, you know, we keep our jobs only because we're tenured, you know. Right. Uh, right. And that's and, that, and, and this is why I tell people uh, tenure is very important because this is one of the purposes I can address these issues. Yes. You know, and, 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 and bring light to th these, these issues that people don't want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but you're exactly right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people may not invite me to. They don't want this this aspect of the data to be revealed. They don't want me taking you know, attention away from their agenda and this and their, and, and their narrative. And it's, it's quite un, 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 unfortunate. To, but I will say that uh, there are a number of people and institutions who say, no, I want to invite him specifically for that reason, nice. because he's the only one really addressing it. He start, he's telling the truth and he's been saying this for a very long time. Yeah. And now we have the State Department, we have Johns Hopkins, we have all these other universities yeah. now who are saying what he's been saying for years. So, mm -hmm. so you know, it, it, you do have some people who are saying, no, we need that voice. But another thing that happens, quite frankly, is when I'm not allowed, but I don't want to say not allowed, but not invited, or when my my uh, proposal is not accepted, what I will remind them is I will send a little letter and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm trying to add diversity to the discussion. You right. know, right. The, 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 right. the, these discussions tend to focus on X, Y, Z, but what the data reflects is this, this, this. And my hope is that you have somebody who's going to address this area of research, which can't be denied. Then people start to say, oh, well, you know what? Yeah, we could we could have thought of it. So, so, you know, uh, but it, yeah, but it's, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, many of us uh, are, are victims to to this kind of uh, behavior. But it's a very real issue uh, in, in, in academia, no, oh, yeah. without a doubt. I'm, you're, I'm laughing because you're teaching me a lesson because my normal response would be, you know what, F you. <laughs> but that's, a much, that's a much smoother response, and I kind of dig that. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, because they just ignore, and they just like, oh, well, no, we're full, oh, no, this, that. And it's like, hey, listen, well, let me just point this out to you, you know. Uh, and that puts them on a hot spot, 
you know. Uh, and, yeah. and so it's almost like, you know what? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, we, we have a spot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, beautiful. And so I'm glad that you that your work is starting to really be appreciated, uh, especially on par with the importance of it. If yeah, the, let me just say this. Right. Let me interrupt you for one second. Just say oh. the Bajabazi piece was actually cited by the United Nations General Assembly. And I was honored by that. Get it. Uh, uh, they 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 um, there was a soldier who really wrote his Congress congressman. And reported what he was seeing and the U.S. Army Inspector General's office, you know, launched an investigation as to what the soldier was saying. So the United States and other countries uh, really started paying attention to these accusations. And the United Nations General Assembly uh, issued a, a uh, uh, an advisory on this issue. Yeah. And my research was one of the uh, publications that they cited. Uh, and distributed in a report that was uh, uh, distributed in, 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 in UN General Assembly. So, I, so you know, I, I'm honored by those things. So while I might be the victim of, you know, ostracism some ways, and people might say, oh, well, yeah, he's anti-woman, he's anti-this, and then I always have to fight back and say, how come when you talk about women issues, you are really, you know, you're doing such a noble thing, but when yeah. I talk about male issues, I'm anti-woman. I said, exactly. I stand for on the side of human dignity and the pro protection of everyone, you mm -hmm. know, women and men. And the research is clear that males are, with respect to this area, are completely ignored. So it was an honor for me to to uh, uh, for, the, for the United Nations to do that, because I, I, I never even knew that. They never called me. The next thing I know, I, nice. I, I, I read a report. I'm doing research. I'm like, well, this is my piece that they're citing. So, 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 uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so, so oh, I, you know, it has, it has some good parts to it. Yeah, no, it, 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 it. Sometimes the story is a, is a good story, I should say. Well, and it's good to hear that because at the end of the day, what we're also talking about is nuance and the opportunity to actually have your work explored with nuance rather than these broad brush stereotype approaches from a distance where people haven't even read your work. You know what I've I found people will do They'll read a title at best. They may read a title or they'll hear about you in a hallway kind of discussion. And then from there, when some, someone else asks them, oh, well, you know, he, uh, you know, Professor Jones, he's this, he's that. Well, did you read the paper? Well, no. Do you know what the title of it is? Well, not really. Well, what makes you think that he hates? Well, I just heard. So, so what you're talking about is nuance. And now for myself, my research, of course, deals with black men and black boys, black males in general. But it also more specifically lately has examined uh, really, you know, structural white supremacy in the context of the black family, the way in which policies have shaped over generation, the engagements of African-Americans uh, one and two each other and the ways in which those institutions begin to shape our, our you know, our, our possibilities, our perceptions, our worldviews in highly problematic and misandrous ways. There's a lot, a lot of nuance for that discussion. You know, people just dismiss it, you know, as whatever, you know, they, they deem it as. So you're inspiring me in that, you know, there can be a point where people entertain your work seriously and give it the nuance and the attention that it deserves because you've done quite a bit. Man, this is, this is, man, this is inspiring to see. Um, Thank you. Thank as far you. as Thank in, Invisible Man, is there any closing thoughts you want to leave us with or any other piece, as a matter of fact, any other piece you've written? Any other closing thoughts and, and anywhere you want to direct us about, you know, your work? So, on yeah. So I, I will I will say this. Uh, one of my one of my latest pieces uh, uh, really dealt. And I don't know if you see this on the list. It talks about law enforcement. What happens when her attacker wears blue? Get it. And uh, uh, that piece is dedicated to uh, victims of of uh, child pornography, child sex trafficking, when the victimizer is a member of law enforcement. Mm. And it is a mm -hmm. it is a an area of of criminal jurisprudence that we really don't talk about. But there is a there has been a tremendous problem with the number of law enforcement uh, officers uh, by their own admission yeah. who are engaged and committing sexual offenses against uh, children. Uh, 
uh, or, or minors, you know, whatever word you want to use uh, in who are engaged in, in you know, uh, child pornography. And I spell out these incidents and discuss these incidents in a very real way in that in that publication. And that has been something that really has uh, uh, really gotten the attention of, of, of a lot of people. Uh, but it's pretty clear that law enforcement a lot of times are engaging in con uh, uh, high levels of sexual misconduct and many of those people are, are, are underage. And uh, 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 it's, a very, it's a very real problem. So and to some degree, they are part of the human trafficking problem in the United States, both in their failure to properly identify uh, child victims of human trafficking, but yeah. also in their failure to identify uh, people within their own ranks who are engaged in sexual misconduct against children, particularly uh, sex trafficking. And I might add that the FBI formally charged a Chicago police officer here in my area, in my city, uh, with sex trafficking. And I talk about that in, in my piece. Wow. Wow. Look, Professor, I really appreciate you coming through and telling, telling us about this. You, you have a, a standing invitation. You know, so if there's anything uh, related to black men and boys you want to drop in and say, shoot me a word and, and you can definitely come through. Also, if you know any other anybody else who's, who's research, you know, fits the mold in terms of that, feel free to, to forward them to me. Because I'm really, you know, especially with the Institute for Black Male Studies, I'm trying to draw, um, you know, people whose research on black men and boys uh, bring something to bear. I'm trying to bring these people together, most particularly black male researchers themselves. Uh, uh, activists, uh, thinkers, whomever else that has something to bring on this topic because there's so much of it that's been weighted down by stereotype or dismissed altogether that we don't find out enough of what we need to. So I want to thank you. And as, we, as as people tend to say to the military, I say to you, I thank you for your service. You know, I really well, well, thank you very much. It is, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I just can't thank you enough for the great work that you're doing. We really need your voice. Uh, uh, verse, uh, I mean, what you're doing is, is is just phenomenal, and you're providing a vehicle to, first of all, educate people on some of the most uh, 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 important issues in, in in our society as they relate to uh, black men and boys. And uh, you certainly are one of the world's leaders on, in in this area. And so it's it's been an honor to be here with you tonight. And and I, I'm going to take you up on coming back one day as well as uh, sending you some names. Cause I, I, I think there's a number of people I can think of who will have something to say. So well, uh, I, I really, really appreciate that. And I appreciate it. Cause again, a lot of the time we we're, we're operating out here, you know, individually, you know what I mean? Just out here trying to figure out how to, how to get our research out there. And um, it, you know, it can be a hard road. It, it's very much like the wild, wild west in a, a lot of instances. So I'm always glad when I, I run across a brother like yourself. So thank you again, man. Thank uh, you, sir. Right. Thank you. Uh, hey. Really appreciate it. Now, have a good night, and we'll talk to you soon. You too. All right. Bye. All right, y'all. Man, powerful interview. I hope uh, you guys are sharing it. We got about 222 people in here, but I find it interesting that uh, if I want to have a, a, a YouTube beef, I might be able to get, a, you know, a two or 300 more people. But if I want to talk about uh, the violation of boys and men in ways that you don't find anywhere else, all of a sudden uh, there's a dearth of people listening. So I find it uh, saddening in a certain respect, but it is what it is. All right. So uh, yes, we are going to have office hours tonight. Um, if you have just become a member, you're not sure how to access the office hours. If you're on Patreon, just look for the latest post, which I will post in the next few minutes. It'll give you a link to the video the video that we're about to do, the live interaction will just be for members. If you're a YouTube member or a recent new member, go to my channel page on YouTube and click on the community tab in the next few minutes and you will see a link for office hours for tonight. Uh, we will start in the next few minutes. So let me get that going. And y'all know how I like to uh, generally close things out. All right. Uh, brothers, be reminded we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, brainless henchmen, valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, 
unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, warriors, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic, selfish, and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace.